Okay, good morning. So let us start uh, today's lesson. I want to introduce to you the matrix theory. So this session is mainly uh, introducing a lot of new terminologies. So it's inevitable. So you have to learn a lot of names. So there is no deep concept going on here. I just want to try to uh, define you a matrix, which is a very simple thing and then I want to define different kind of matrices so you have to learn a lot of terminology and jargon in this case so that in the future when we want to talk about them in a little bit deeper way I am referring to these names over and over again so you need to know what I mean by those names okay so might be that would be a good idea if I start doing uh, so here so what do i mean by a matrix so let me have my so what do we mean by a matrix a matrix is a rectangular array of uh, actually numbers so a rectangular array of numbers as you see here for example in this example so i have written some rectangular array of matrix of, of numbers for you okay and uh, so here, and then this is one thing that you need to know, this, these are rows and these are columns, yes? And then usually we use capital Latin letters to denote matrices. So this matrix is, so there is no restriction in uh, the numbers that you put in the matrix. By the way, the name of these numbers in the matrix, each one of them is called an entry, yes? So I have written, I hope that here, yes, here, this word entry, or element sometimes you say. So every element in the matrix is actually called an entry or an element, okay? So every matrix has some number of rows, as have, have some number of columns. So here, for example, this matrix A, which I call it A, has three rows and two columns. This matrix has how many rows? Two rows and three columns. So this matrix C has just one row and how many columns? One, two, three, four, five. Yes, each one of them is a column. So that's also a matrix. Okay. So you see I have matrix D and I have matrix E and I have matrix F. So if I ask you what is this matrix F, you will say me that this matrix has exactly one row and one column. But this matrix E has two rows but one column. Okay, so these are so it, you see that's not something. So you just write a rectangular array of numbers, and it doesn't matter what are those numbers. For example, in this case D, you see that I am using pi and the square root of three minus square root of three decimal point zeros fractions everything. So you can put everything. Even you can put complex numbers inside the matrix. But this is not our concern here. We just work with real numbers okay and uh, okay so let me now so write try to write something on the board uh, I have to switch the camera so here if I have a matrix A it is common to denote the entries with little a okay and then I write two indices, i and j, and this is always, by convention, the first number the, represents the row number, and the second number represents the column number. Yes. For example, if I say that a, 2, 3, for this matrix, assuming that this matrix is, uh, by the way, for example, I can write 5 by 7. This is the way that we use it. When I write matrix A and I write something like this below that, it means that the number of rows is 5. It's also convention. The first one actually specifies the number of rows and the second one specifies the number of columns. So assume that you have a typical matrix 5 by 7 and then you write little a with two indices 2, 3. So this means that you are referring to the entry in this matrix which is sitting on the second row and third column. Yes, that's it. For example, let me write this. For example, let me change 
my notation. So I have B. Uh, let me write it. Let me take it, uh, for example, 2 by 3. Okay. The one which is here, I show it with B, but indices 1, 1. It means that this is the entry on the first row, on this first column, of a matrix whose name is capital B. This is the standard way of writing. For example, what is the next one to the right? What is that? B, 1, 2. 1, 2. So I just want you to get used to this convention. In matrix theory, the numbers coming first has something to do with the rows. The numbers coming on the second has something to do with columns. Yes? So when, when you see this, sorry, when you see 5 by 7, so don't get confused. No one will explain which one is the number of rows, which one is the number of columns. You have to know that. The first number is the number of rows. The second number is the number of columns. So here, the next one will be B13. You see all of them are sitting on the first row. This is why all of them start with 1. But this is on the first column. So there is, this is why you have 1. This is on the second column, you have two. This is on the third column, you have three. And then if you go to the next one, what happens? It becomes B what? Two, two one, B, two, two, and B, two, three. Yes? So this is the way that you name them. And of course, uh, you might ask what happens if these numbers are big. Then you usually separate them by a comma. For example, if you have a matrix, C, which is, I don't know, 12 by 13, yes, for example, if you want to address this last entry, what do you write? You write little c, can you tell me what is the last entry here? What is the row number for the last entry? It is 12. And if, of course, you write 13 immediately after that, it is a little bit ambiguous. So in that case, you separate them by a comma. So, but these are minor things, yes? Usually we don't care about that. Any questions so far? Yeah. Okay, so let me also learn how to go back and forth. So now I have to change the recording to this and I should also go to this one so that you can see it better. For example, here, let me just explain it to you. So for example, what is the size of this matrix, everyone? What is the size of this matrix? 3, 2. Three, two. So remember, th this way of moving, 3, 2. This ma matrix is 2 by 3. three. This matrix is? 0. No. 1, one by six. 5. Five. Yes? What is this one? 3 by 3. What is this one? 2, two, one, two by 1. And then this is 1 by 1. So if you want to write it, it doesn't mean 3 times 2, it means 3 by 2, okay? And for example, if I ask you what is C15, it means that you need to go to matrix C, read the entry on the first row, fifth column. And then if you go to the first row, fifth column, the number is minus square root of 2. So these are the symbols and notations that you need to know, okay? I don't think it needs explanation, it's very, very simple. Okay. Okay, so there is a remark and convention again. Yes, okay, let us go back to this matrix F here. This matrix is one, one by one. By convention, you identify it with phi itself, phi itself. So if you have a one by one matrix, instead of writing it like this, you just write five. So we do not differentiate between a one by one matrix and its own entry. Okay, so that is the content of this remark that I have written here for you. Okay, uh, so this is the general form of an M by N matrix. Do you agree? So if I have M by N, it means that I have M rows and N columns. So if, I want, if you want to imagine an M by N matrix, this is how you should imagine if the name of the matrix is capital A. So this is A11 up to A1N because all of them are sitting on the first row. The first one is on the first column, second column, third column, until the nth column. And if you go down, the number, the row uh, number changes, but on each column, the column number remains the same. Yes. 
Sorry, could you explain the remark once more? The, 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 the remark was telling you that if you accidentally have a matrix which is one by one, just yeah. write it, instead of writing a square five as a matrix five, you just write five. Yes, that's it. Very simple remark. Yeah. Okay. So, but this, this notation is something we need to write because sometimes if we want to prove something regarding matrices, we cannot write all these irrelevant information. We just want to a compact. We want to have a compact notation for that. And this is the notation that I will actually use. Okay. So, for example, here, uh, if I have what I'm saying is that if someone tells me that I have a matrix in this form, that is good enough for me. This is all the information that I need. Okay, so when I see this, I realize that I am facing a matrix which has M rows and N columns and a typical element of that is written in this form. So this is a compact notation for the extended version that I showed you before. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Uh, Another thing is that this is also very common and very useful. Sometimes I denote the entry instead of writing little a sub ij, I write the name of the matrix capital A, and around that I put a pair of brackets sometimes or a pair of parentheses, and then put i, i, and j as indices. So this is exactly, this means exactly little a, i, j. Okay? So remember, this is another notation which is used, and it will be useful. You will see that. Yes? So is that clear? So, for example, here, what does it mean? It means that go to your matrix A in that example, and then go to the first, second row, and second column and read the entry. If you go to that matrix, probably in this example, yes, I go to the second row, second, int second column, you see it is zero. Okay, so that these are different ways of addressing the same thing, and you will see that all of them will be necessary at this point. Okay? Okay, yeah, let us do a very, very simple example. So, I have given you this symbol, and I have defined you what is the entry here, and I'm asking you to write A as a rectangular array. Okay, so what is this? I will come back to this. So you have A, it's written A to be A sub IJ, and I have written two by two, so everyone understands what is the meaning of this. And then I have written A I sub J is what? I plus I squared plus two J. And then I want to write this as a rectangular array, okay? Okay, so what should I do? Yeah, let me just do this very patiently from scratch. So when I see this symbol here on the board, I realize that my matrix is a two by two matrix. Okay, so this is A11, this is A12, this is A21, and this is A22. Yes? Are these symbols understandable for everyone? Yes? Now I have to calculate these according to this rule. So this is telling me that a i j is defined i squared plus 2 j. If you want to express it in words, it tells you that if you are interested to the entry sitting on the i through j column, take the row number, square it, take the column number, multiply it by 2 and add the results. It gives you a number and put that number in the appropriate place. And this will give you the matrix. So sometimes matrices are defined by mathematical formulas rather than writing all the elements one by one okay so here i want to calculate a11 what is a11 it is one squared plus two times one why is that because in this case both i and j are equal to one so i put them here and i calculate this it becomes three and then i calculate a12 it means one squared plus two times two Yes, and it becomes what? 5. And then I go calculate A21, which is 2 squared plus 2 times uh, 1. 
What is that? It's 4, 2, 6. And finally, a2, 2. two. A sub to 2, if you want to write, uh, read it properly, so it's 2, it's 8. And then finally, what you have to write as the answer is what? So 3, 5, 6, and 8. Yes? Can you have two same numbers in the... Everything can happen. We don't have any restrictions whatsoever for the entries. But you have to be careful not to make mistakes in your arithmetic and calculation. So that's very simple. Is that clear? Okay. I think, uh, okay, it's a good idea. Yes? Do you have questions? I don't know if this is a related question, but what happens if, uh, you, if there's a formula, theoretically, and in one case the answer turns out to be an undefined number, like something divided... No, by that is ill-defined question. Then. then it's an undefined question. Yeah, right? ill-defined, I would say, because if you say this is the matrix, and this should follow this one. For example, if I give you uh, this relation, I cannot expect you to write a matrix because A11 is not defined. Even though I say that I have A11 here, but A11 is not defined because the denominator vanishes. Yeah. So it means that I have, that's my responsibility to give you a okay, correct so way of def definition. So yes. if there is one situation where it's not defined, then, then, then it doesn't work as a question. Yeah, that, that matrix is not defined properly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Every number will be valid. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So what we are saying now is I want to, uh, it's very thing, I have to concentrate a lot of things, yes? So I want to show you the next example. I want to wait for you to do it yourself, okay? Uh, but I have to pause recording a lot of things I have to do. Uh, I have to first switch to Acrobat and then probably, yes, it is on the, which is, I want you to do this example for me. B is given in this. So I'm just, this is nothing deep at all. It's just telling to get you, it's just practicing to get used to, of not, uh, to get used to notation. Yes? So just do that one for me, please. Okay, yeah, I think it was a simple problem, yes? So if I want to uh, write down the details of this matrix, first of all, I see it is 2 by 3. It means that it has two rows and three columns. So in general, if I want to write it, I have to write B11, B12, and B13. And then I have to write B21, B22, and B23, yes? And then I have to calculate each one of them individually. But of course, I don't have one single rule. I have two rules depending on how large is the, the column index is and how large is the row index. So what should I do? Uh, for example, for B11, which one applies? The first one. Because the first one is acceptable if i is greater than or equal to j. And in this case, i and j are both equal to 1. So I have to use this rule, and instead of i, I have to put 1, and instead of j, I have to put 1 and subtract. And this becomes 0. But if I go to 1, 2, which rule applies? The second rule. The second rule, because this is i, and this is j. And here i is less than j, so it means the second rule is applicable. But in this case, j is in the numerator, which is 2, and in the denominator, I have 1. So if I calculate this, it becomes 2. And then I go to B13, it becomes what? Uh, 3 over 1, because the same rule applies again. And then the answer becomes 3, yes? Okay, and then I go to B21. Which one applies? First. The first one applies. So what should I write? I is 2, J is 1, so it becomes 2 minus 1, which is 1. And then I go to B2, 2. Again, the first rule applies, but here both of them are equal. So this one is 0. And then I have B2, 3, which is, which one applies here? Second. The second. So it becomes 3 over 2. We can keep it like that. So then, of course, if you want to write as the answer, so you have to write B is equal to uh, 0, 2, 3, 
1, 0, 3 over 2. Yes, so that is the answer to this problem. Okay, any questions? Uh, okay, let us go to the next problem. So consider the following matrix because these consecutive sums appear a lot in matrix theory. So I want to make your brain a little bit ready so that you know how to act with these things. So you see, first of all, I have been a little bit careless. I have two consecutive sums. Do you remember what is the notation of sigma? Yes? So sigma uh, means... So sigma, if you have a sigma, you should have a counter, you should have something inside the sigma. For example, let me write A, and then I have to put an index somewhere. It doesn't matter where. For example, let me just use it as a subscript. You can use it as a power, you can use it as the argument of a function, you can use it wherever you want to. But the point is that this counter of the sigma should start from an integer and goes up to another integer. Okay, and the answer, for example, it can start from m to n, but the restriction is that you have to respect n should be greater than or at least equal to n. Okay, what does this mean? It means that go and replace the counter with the lowest value, so it becomes a m, and then start increasing this integer one by one so that you reach to the end limit. So then. The next one is a m plus 1, so I have replaced the counter with the next number. I will replace the counter with the next number, and I continue this process until finally I reach to the final limit, and I replace the counter with the final limit, so it becomes a sub n, and what I do at the end, I have to add all these things together. Okay? So that is the meaning of the uh, sigma notation. And this is very good. Instead of writing something so long, we write it like this. That's the meaning of sigma notation. Yes. Well, what if uh, n is a decimal? It doesn't matter. No, no. n okay. cannot be decimal. Okay. By definition, m and n has to be integers. Otherwise, it is not defined properly. Okay. So this symbol that you see is only defined when these two numbers are integer, and the number above is at least equal to the number below. That's the way you have to define the sigma. For example, you can yeah. have negative numbers. Yes, for example, you can have sigma. Let me consider a function. Let me give you a function, f of x equals to x squared, for example. And then I write this sigma. i goes from minus 2 to 1, f of i. I ask you, if this is the function, calculate this sum. So what does it mean? You go here, you immediately realize the counter, the counter is i. What you have to do, you have to replace the counter with the lowest value, and then increase the counter one at a time. It becomes, what is the next after minus two? What is that? Negative. negative? No, after. You minus go to one. the right. It's negative one. And then the next one? Zero. F of zero. Am I done yet? No. I haven't reached to this limit, so I go one more step. It is what? F of 1, and then I have to add all of these together. So that is the meaning of this sum. Yes? What if you wanted to increment it by, instead of incrementing it by 1, you would increment it by like 1 half? It's a good question. I haven't seen. Might be there are some symbols for because that, but I, I don't have it in my mind now. Because I know in programming there's a thing called a for loop, which is very similar to this. I mean, uh -huh. There you can increment it by whatever you want. So you yeah, I understand. In programming yeah. you can do that, but I don't know if there is a symbol for that okay. in mathematics. But Might it would be. be pretty useful. Right? Yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, it is not a big problem mathematically. You can enter another number somewhere, so you can put a number on top here and say that this is the number of steps that I want to do, yes. Oh, that's a pi. Yeah, like capital pi, right? But that's a product. A product. But are you answering his question oh, or no, you are no, second some? Okay, yes, second. that's a separate question. Okay, yes, yes, I will also talk about that if you want to. But in matrix theory, we need mostly, mainly this one, yes. Okay, so, and then it is not finished yet because now I have already given you a function 
and I have asked you to calculate this sigma based on this defined function. So you just, this is the definition of sigma, but the definition of sigma is finished here. There is one more step. I have to calculate each one of them individually and then add them. So f of minus 2 is what? 4. f of minus 1 is 1. f of 0 is 0. f of 1 is 1. And you add them, it becomes 6. So that's a very simple. So this counter could be everywhere. Yes? And one more question I want to ask. If I give you this question and I ask you this. What the answer is? One second. You have one second. What the answer to this sigma is? Two seconds. Three seconds. Yes. No? What's the answer to this sigma? Minus two. No. What is the answer in front of this? Six again. It doesn't matter. The counter name doesn't matter. Oh, you mean the still... still yeah, what, if I ask you to calculate this sigma, what do you do? You take the counter out, which in this case is j, and then you replace j with the first number, you get f of minus 2. And then you increase it one unit, the next one becomes f of minus 3. Do you agree with me or not? Is it clear? So this is why we say that the counter of a sigma is a dummy variable, yes? So it doesn't matter if you change all the names. So it's a dummy variable. So it means that if you change the counter name everywhere in the sigma to something else, the result of the sigma will not change. And that's good to know in passing, yes? Function, no, of course. If the chain, no, the counter. The counter is the variable that appears here. Of course, if I change the function to something else, this will change. And of course, this will also change. It doesn't matter. What I'm saying is that if you calculated a sigma with a name for the counter, if you decide to change the name of the counter everywhere in the sigma to something else, then what will happen? The result of the sigma will not change. Okay? Is that clear? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Uh, one thing, for example, there are many things that you can discover. It is good to understand, to be able, of course, you can always start proving things from scratch because it's not a very deep concept. It's just a notation. But to become faster, it's better to always understand what is going on. For example, uh, what happens to this sigma? Can you tell me? I write f. I write i plus 2, and then I write i minus 4 and minus 1. Can you immediately answer this sum based on what we have already calculated? So I am just trying to motivate you. You have this number, it is 6. Based on this calculation, I am asking you what would be the answer of that guy? Six. Again, 6. So is that understandable? So what I have done, I have added a fixed number 2 to the counter inside the sigma, but I have compensated for that addition by subtracting 2 from these limits. By the way, this is called the lower limit, and that's called the upper limit. Is that understandable? Why? Because what I'm supposed to do to calculate this, I am supposed to take the counter and replace the counter by the first number. But because... Uh, what, what will happen if I put minus 4 here? Minus 4 plus 2 becomes minus 2. So the first term is f of minus 2. What was the first term here? It was f of minus 2. Yes? And then what is the next one? I have to go to minus 3. I have to replace i with minus 3. Minus 3 plus 2, it becomes minus 1. So it becomes f of minus 1. Hopefully I don't want to spend some time on it. It's clear that it will generate the same thing. For example, if I go to the last one, sorry. if I go to the last one, and what is the last one? I put minus 1 here, minus 1 plus 2 is 1, and the last one will be f of 1, and the last one here is also f of 1. Okay, let me ask you one more question. So, what happens if I calculate, so I want to do this. I write j, so let me write, let me write l, and then I would write minus 3. I want to give the role of the counter to l. Okay, I'm asking you fix these question marks so that the result will also be 6.
minus two minus five. Uh, minus three minus five. Let me see. What did you say? On top minus no minus two, and on bottom minus five. No. Is it uh, four and one? Uh, uh, four and one. Yeah. So this should be one. This should be four. Yes. So this is clear. When you add something to the counter inside the sigma to compensate for that, you have to subtract the same number from both the lower limit and the upper limit. If you are subtracting something from the counter in the sigma, you have to compensate that by adding the same number to the lower limit and upper limit. It's very trivial. I mean, you don't need to memorize that. Just a little bit of thinking will convince you. Why is that? Let us do that again. What I'm supposed to do if I want to expand is I have to take L away and put 1. So what happens, it becomes F of 1 minus 3 because F of minus 2 again. Yes, and then I continue until I put the last one. 4 minus 3 is 1, so the last one is F of 1, so that's clear. So this is the something that you need to understand. Another thing that I wanted to understand is, it's important, if I have a sigma, I... This is a little bit needs explanation. For example, I write from 1 to 3. And then uh, I write just a number 5 here. How do you interpret that? This is a little bit, uh, it needs a little bit of explanation. So what do you think about this sigma? Yes, Cami? I think it's a constant. No, every sigma at the end will be a constant, but which constant and how you calculate that? Yes, Robert? I think it would just be 5 plus 5 plus 5. Yes. But how can you interpret that? Because it's a little bit strange, yes? I told you that when you want to open up a sigma, what you have to do, you have to take the counter and replace it by the first number and then do it and replace the counter. But there is no counter in this. Yes? So if you want to justify this, what he said, he said 5 plus 5 plus 5, and I agree with him. He answered that this is 15. But how can you justify this? Can you tell me? Yes? Well, because you start at the lower limit uh -huh. there, and there you would, when you would have a counter in, like, the, uh, what's it called, the other part again? Um, like, what, what the 5 is right now. Um, the counter? Yeah, the counter. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Um, you were supposed to uh, increase it every time, and you take that number when you had increased it and put it. Over. No, I understand. This is. So I mean, just I want you to. I don't know if if this is good for you or not. So you can say that if I tell you that a i. By the way, when you write a sub i, this is defining a function for you. Yes. So this means that this is a constant function. So I would say that a, f, a i is 5 for all i. This upside down a means for all. Yes? So this means that if I ask you to open up this sigma, you write a sub 1 plus a sub 2 plus a sub 3, and I don't have any restrictions in how I want to define my uh, expression inside. Yes? If you don't, want, if you don't like it, you can, you can define a function f of x to be a constant function 5. Yes? This is a function. Here I define my function to be x squared. Here I define my function to be 5. And then I ask you to calculate this. Okay? On the one hand, the answer to this is f of 1 plus f of 2 plus f of 3. Do you agree? By definition. What is the answer of f of 1? 5. 5, 5. What is the answer? 15. On the one hand, you have to admit the answer is 15. But on the other hand, what can I write about f of i in general? What can I write about f of i? What can I write about f of i? Tell me. f of x is 5. What is f of i? 5. five. five. Now, hopefully, I could convince you that this is indeed the case. So I define a function, a constant function, and I write my sigma in this form and then expand it and then find the result. So this is the case. Yes? Is that clear? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Let me ask you one question because I, mainly I think you will make a mistake here. Let us see. Prove me wrong, okay? So I would write 5 here. 
and then I would write i equals to 7 to 20. Uh, I, I think it's a good. It's not a good number for you, so let me just write 10. It's easier to calculate. So what's the answer to this thing? Yes? 50. How many of you agree? How many of you agree? Raise your hand and be responsible for your answer. 51? 52? Yes? 55. Why is that? Yes? Yeah, counts too. So they, because from 10 to 20, you think that there are 10 numbers, there are 11 numbers, because you're counting 10 and 20 itself. Yes? So be careful. So if I ask you how many terms are involved, if I expand the sigma, if you say 10, it's not correct. Is that clear? If, if I ask you how many numbers are there from 1 to 10, including 1 and 10, if you say 10 minus 1, 9, it's completely wrong. Yes, because how many numbers are there? There are 10 numbers. So remember, if you want to expand the sigma, so let me just ask you this question. Assume that I have sigma, I have some constant number, C representing a constant, and I write I goes from M to N. Can you write the general formula in front of it? Assuming that, of course, N is greater than or equal to M, as usual. Yes? N minus M plus 1. Not finished. Yes? N minus M, M plus 1. Agree? Is, is that the... No. Time C. Time C. Yes? That's the answer. So remember, I think I haven't written it down in my notes. It is good to write somewhere this one. So it's good. So remember, if you have sigma, and suddenly you see inside the sigma you have something constant which does not... By the way, what do I mean by constant? Here, C is a letter. But how should I realize this is a constant? Because it does not depend to the counter. When I say something is constant with respect to a given sigma, it means that that thing inside does not depend to the counter, on the counter of the sigma. Yes? Yeah, is that clear? Yes? Why did you times uh, the equation by C? No, exactly like this. Yeah. You found how many terms are there, and then you multiplied by this 5 to give me the answer. Yes. So you wrote how many terms are there? 11 terms, but yeah. you didn't write 11. You write okay. 11 times 5. And that's exactly the same thing. This is the number of terms involved in this sigma, but each one is C, so if I want to find the sum, I have to multiply it by C as well. Yeah. Yes? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so what do you think about this situation? If I have a sigma, and then I have, for example, a sub k here, plus b sub k here, and then I write k goes from m to n. Do you think that I can break this sigma into two sigmas? So, so if you say yes, what is your guess? What should I write in front of it? You can take first the a k, then b k. Yeah, I mean that you need to write sigma k from m to n a k plus sigma k from m to n b k. Yes, it's clear and understandable. Yes, which properties of numbers are involved? Which properties of addition are involved here to be able to say this is correct? First of all, everyone understand why this should be correct? Because what you do, you just replace k with the first number. It becomes a sub m plus b sub m. And then you go to the next term, a sub m plus 1 plus b sub m plus 1. And then you continue this process until you reach to the end, yes? But everyone knows that instead of doing this, I can put a's next to each other in one group and put b's next to each other in another group, yes? So what can I do? I can rearrange this sum in this form. Okay? I can rearrange them. Everyone agrees? Because of which properties? Because of commutativity. It doesn't matter in which order I add. And because of associativity, it doesn't matter in which way I group them. 
Because of these two properties, I can do this. And now, if I ask you, can you write this more compactly? You will say, yes, this is just sigma a k. k goes from 1 to, from m to n. And the other one is sigma a sub k. Sorry, b sub k. k goes from m to n. Yes. But for example, what do you think? Can I decompose this sigma into two sigmas? In a straightforward way, I mean. No. No. Yes, because what happens, this becomes a1 times b1 plus a time, a2 times b2, and there is no way that I can put a's together and b's together. Yes. Is that clear? So, I mean, you don't need to actually memorize these things. So, these are simple things that by a little bit of thinking you can understand. Is that clear? Yes? Uh, Okay, so one important property, okay, let me just talk about these consecutive sums. You might have two indices as counter of a sigma. So, for example, in this case, let me just write, I can have a sigma and then I can have another sigma. For example, I can say i goes from 1 to 2, j goes from uh, one, two, three, and then I can write A, I, G. Okay, so what is the meaning of this? First of all, I have to be careful. I wasn't a little bit, I was not completely careful when I was writing that. I have to put a pair of brackets unless I prove that this is not necessary. Okay, so when, I, when, when you see this symbol, when you see this symbol, two sigmas, by definition, you give the priority to the inner sigma, and then after the inner sigma is done, you do it with the other sigma. That's the definition of consecutive sigmas. Okay, so if I ask you to open this up, completely expand this, write this expression without using sigma notation, how do you write that? What you need to do, according to the definition, you will give the priority to the inner sigma. What does it mean? It means that you do not touch the other sigma at all and try to expand the inner one. So in the inner one, I have two letters. One of them is constant if I am considering this sigma because the counter of the sigma is J. So this means that I am not allowed to touch I, but I will change I, J from 1 up to 3 and add them. So this becomes A. I1, A, I2, and A, I3, and add these three. So I have opened up the inner sigma. And now I have to open up the other sigma. So how was, how was it? I have to replace the counter of the sigma, which is I. But I appears in three positions. So I have to change I to 1 in all of them. So then it means this becomes A11 plus A12 plus A13. And this is the first term of this sigma. And then I have to replace I with 2. It becomes A21 plus A22 plus A23. Yes? And then I add. So that would be the result of this sigma. Yes? But if it was 3 up there, yes? at the end, then we, we, we would need to make it 2 separate. No. If, if, if you mean that if it is 3? Yeah. If it is 3, then this will be 3. Then it means that this is not finished. I have to continue one more step. Okay. Yes? But wouldn't it just be like 1, 2, and 3 then? Uh, I don't understand your question. Okay, never mind. So, did, so you see, if it is 2, do you agree with this calculation so far? Yes. If it is not 2, it is 3, it means that I have one more step to do. Mm -hmm. Instead of stopping at the level of 2, I have to go and stop at level 3. Okay. At level 3, it means that I will change i to 3 everywhere and write it again. But like, in that one, you went up from 1 to 3, right? Here? Yeah, no, the first one. This one. So I, uh, I okay, I keep two. I the same. Yeah. 
forget about this momentarily. Yeah. I keep the i the same yeah. and change j to one. Yes. Then j to two. Then j to three. And then add them. Add them. But because this is the only thing appears in the first sigma. Yeah. In the second sigma. So what you are saying is that you want to open the sigma up. Is that what you mean? No, I just like don't open it at all. Just keep it like uh, I one two I three I. No, no, no I mean uh, one one two two three three. Yes, I have. No, so this is not the case. Where is that function? No, I, because exactly I don't I don't exactly understand what you mean. Just can you repeat? What should I write? What you mean? So it if means that three up so there. you mean that I should write this for, so far like this? Yes. Okay. And then how do you want me to proceed after this level? Just write one one two two three three. This one? Yeah. If, if it was a three up there. If it assume, assume that this is a three up yeah. there, okay? So you say that this would be the result? No. Why wouldn't it be this? No, this is not the result because what is sitting here, if you want to insist, uh, you can see it in two different ways. One way is to use this rule, okay, to open this sigma here plus the sigma here plus the sigma here. Mm -hmm. But the sigma first includes two terms. The, sigma, the second sigma includes two terms. The sigma here includes two terms. Okay. But another way to understand this is give this guy a name. This depends on one index i, so you can call it bi. Okay? Right. So in your head, it, this is something a little bit bigger, but you can write it as something which depends only on i, and then you have sigma uh, bi, i goes from 1 to 2, and then what you can do, you can write b1 plus b2. But if I ask you what is b1, you will tell me b1 it means this, but instead of i, I have to put 1. So it contains three terms. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is that clear? Yes. Okay. So this is the answer to this one. So this would be here. Okay? But now, if I interchange them, what will happen? So if I write sigma, j goes from 1 to 3 first, and then I write sigma, i goes from 1 to 2, and then I write a i j. Yes. Why don't you multiply the two sigmas? No, it is not the multiplication. That is brackets. No, what is the meaning of multiplying a sigma? Sigma doesn't mean anything. Sigma is a symbol. What what do you want to do? Isn't sigma in the end a number? It's a number, but you should follow some strict rules to reach that number. Okay. There is nothing about product. This you cannot say this is the product. What I'm saying is that if you have two consecutive sigmas, uh -huh. This doesn't mean that this symbol is being multiplied by this symbol. There's no meaning to the symbol itself unless you have something depending on the counter in front of it. And then you have to open it up by writing the terms and adding them up. Okay, so if I want to do this, of course you can guess the result. Do you think the result will be different? The intermediate steps are different, but both of them will give the uh, 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 rise to the same result. Yes? If I want to calculate this, let me know. Okay, how should I do that? The priority, as by convention, is the inner, with the inner sigma. So what I have to do, I have to keep the outer, outer sigma here. And then what should I do? I have to keep j constant, because this sigma relates to i. And then I have to replace i with 1, and then replace i with 2. So it becomes a... 1j plus a1, a2j. Yes? And then I have to open up the last sigma. So what should I do? I have something which relates itself to j, and j is my counter. So what I have to do, I have to replace the counter with this one. Uh, one. And then I have to replace the counter everywhere by the second number. Yes? And then I have to replace the counter everywhere with a third number. And then what to do? And then add them. This addition is this sigma. These additions are this addition. Yes, so you need to understand. Of course, so you see that this is different from that in the way that I write it down. 
But the final answer is the same. Is that clear? Yes or no? Okay. Now, to, to understand, actually, this from a matrix point of view, so be, be uh, comfortable with this. Whenever you have con consecutive sigmas, order doesn't matter. Okay? You can interchange any number of these consecutive sigmas and without affecting the final result. You, of course, will affect the intermediate result. So, for example, uh, if, let me, instead of solving that example that I have written, you can do it yourself. Let me just be a little bit more generic here. So here, let me consider a matrix A, M by N matrix. So A1, 1, A1, 2, and then I continue A1, N, A2, 1, A2, 2, A2N, and then I continue AM1, AM2, AMN. Yes? This is M by N matrix. Okay, can you interpret these things? What does this sigma mean? I goes from 1 to M, J goes from 1 to N, and what does this sigma, you, how can you interpret these two sigmas? And then you can immediately realize why they are equal, if you have a good interpretation, yes? So what we know, we were probably were able to convince you that don't worry, these two sigmas are always the same. So you see, I am interchanging. Be careful, I am not changing the limits. The limit of I is the same, the limits of J are the same, but I'm just interchanging. So you know that these two are equal, but how can you interpret it as a matrix? Yes? Because even if they go this way, this way, you will end up here. That's the same thing. So which one is which? Can you tell me? This uh, one, which way you are going first? I think if you follow I, uh, N first, because if saw N first. Okay, so I mean, what is, the, what is this one? You are adding what for calculating the inner sigma? Uh, it would be... For every fixed I, you are adding vertically. Yes? So if I ask you, if for I equals to 1, the sigma is adding this vertically so you are adding vertically and then horizontally in this case but here you are adding horizontally first and vertically second of course it doesn't matter if i ask you what this number represents this is the sum of all entries in this matrix yes it doesn't matter how you calculate the sum so these two are the same so be careful about this thing so these are equal if someone asks you, what is this number? You would say this is the sum of all entries. What is this number? The sum of all entries. It is clear that the sum of the entries are the same. It doesn't matter how you calculate. Any questions? Okay. Now, I have introduced a notion of matrix to you. Of course, if you do not have any algebra there, it's useless. So you should be able somehow to combine matrices. For example, you have to define how to add them, multiply them. At least you have to define some operations between them. And here, you should also expect... So, so let me just tell you in this way. So, first of all, if you want to construct an algebra, what is the first step? You, you need, for example... Uh, if you want to have an algebra, so you should be able to understand what numbers are equal. So you should have a definition of equality. So for example, if someone is saying that the answer is 2, another person is saying that it is no, it is not 2, it is 4 over 2, you realize that they are talking about the same thing, because 4 over 2 is exactly equal to 2. So we should have the definition of equality for this concept. And now, if you are a mathematician, how do you think you will, be def you will define equality of two matrices. When do you say two matrices are equal in your head? Very natural one. I want, I'm asking these questions because I want you to understand it is not a mysterious thing. If you yourself were, I don't know, an ancient mathematician and you wanted to develop this theory, you would go for the most natural definitions. Okay? Now I'm asking you, if you want to define the equality of two matrices, how do you define it? 
Yes, Rico. The sum. What then? The sum of the matrices. No, we haven't. So, so you have to be very careful in this course. Yes, it's math specialization. We haven't defined the sum of two matrices yet. No, I give you a matrix. I what? You had all the numbers in one matrix. Uh huh. So in principle, I don't know, you are considering these two matrices the same. So you say that if you call me this 1, 2, 3, 4, what's the sum? It's 3, 3, 6, 10. And then B, in your definition, these two matrices are the same. No, no, but they, you said that if the, the sum of the entries are the same, I call them equal. It's... I don't have any objection with that. You might start with this definition of equality and carry on. And if, I just want you to understand what is the mathematics. So if you come up with some theories and applications with, based on this definition, you are constructing a mathematical structure. Yeah, and that's okay. Yes? It's exactly like the rules of some games. You just invent a new game and try to see if it is useful or not. But for me, it was not the most natural way of definition, yes? Because by equality, somehow, it's the most restrictive uh, comparison between two objects, yes? We, based on intuition, we want to see that they are exactly the same. Of course, this is not the case, because 4 over 2 does not look exactly like 2. But we say that they are equal. So these deviations have happened. But in principle, this is one way of defining, but this is not the standard definition. And I don't know if we can explore the consequences of this definition. Yes. But another another way, if you want to say two matrices are equal. Yes, Rogo? Yeah, so maybe it could be if, uh, first off, their dimensions are equal, and secondly, it would be if, like every entry uh, at the, in every position is equal. Corresponding. Yeah, corresponding. I mean, at the end, you have two identical matrices. Okay? So, yes, I think, at least what I think, what I know is that this is the standard definition of equality of two matrices. So, two matrices A and B are said to be equal. If the number of rows of this and the number of rows of this are the same, if the number of columns of in and the column number, uh, the number of columns of this are the same, and every entry of A is equal to the corresponding entry of B, this is the standard definition of equality of two matrices. So in principle, you cannot differentiate them with your eyes unless, for example, this matrix. Uh, one, so let me write this one. This matrix C, if I write it one, two, three, four, and I write one, one, this matrix does not look be, to be the same. But by definition, they are not equal because they are not of the same order. Yes? But, for example, if I take this one and instead of that one, I can write square root of four, then what happens? This matrix and that matrix are equal. Yes? Because first of all, they have the same number of rows and columns. And each entry here is equal to its corresponding entry here. I am comparing this one with this one. I'm not comparing this one with that one. So these two matrices are equal. So that's the definition of equality of two matrices. Yes? Is that clear? Uh, okay. So, for example, if we go down... So definition of equality of two matrices. So for example, you see here example 1.8. Uh, so these matrices that I have written here, is it possible to choose this variable x so that A becomes equal to matrix C? No, no because matrix A is a 2 by 2 matrix. My matrix C is a 2 by 3 matrix. So they cannot be made equal. But can I make... Uh, a equal to B by fine-tuning X? Yes. yes, because first of all, both of them are 2 by 2, and they actually share three entries, 2, 1, and 3. So what I have to choose for X is just 4. If I choose X to be 4, then it becomes equal to this matrix B. Yes, is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Do you have questions? Uh, yeah, so 
theoretically, if you had a quadratic equation, yes. there could be two possible yeah. solutions yeah. for x yeah. here. Yeah. So yeah. Or either none. Or none. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, this can happen. Yes. Yes? Have you, put, have you put this document on the drive? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's a very simple exercise, but I prefer to wait for you to solve it. I, I mean, it's extremely simple at this level, I know, but uh, you have to wait and be patient a little bit because when we reach the product of matrices, things become more interesting. Okay? Before that, they are not very, to be honest, very interesting. So you have to wait a little bit. Okay, so I want to wait for you to solve this problem for me. Just if you... Nine. Pardon? One point nine. Yeah. Okay, could you solve the problem? Is there any answer or there are no answers? Because I don't know if I fine-tuned it correctly or not. Could you find x and y? Yeah. So what is x and what is y? Two. Both of them are two? Yeah. Okay. So do you think it's... So which one is acceptable? Because when I see that, first of all, these two matrices A and B could be equal, yes? yes. Because both of them are two by two. By two. So then x squared should be equal to 4. So there, how many solutions are there for x? 2. Two, either one, either two or minus two, but are both of them acceptable? No, no, because x plus three is also supposed to be equal to two x plus one, which gives rise to x equals to two. Yes, so it means that minus two is not acceptable. Yes, but still there is no. So you cannot say that okay, uh, I don't need to calculate x anymore. But you have to check everything. Is it possible for if I choose x equals to 2 and put them here, you will find y. y also becomes 2. Yes? And then when you have x and y, you put here and calculate it. What would be the final answer? 0. 0. Yes? Well, the answer is 0 to this one. So that's a very simple exercise. I know you might be a little bit tired, but the next one I can rush a little bit because that is very simple. These are terminologies I want you to know. These are just names, nothing else. What do we mean by a row matrix? You already know what does it mean. Yeah, that, that's a good name. A row matrix is a matrix containing exactly one row. Okay, now tell me, is C a row matrix? Yes. Yes, because it contains one single row, even though it also contains one single column, but who cares about the number of columns? This if you have one row. single row, you call it a row matrix. It's if you have one single column, you can call it a... Column, column matrix. matrix. So this C is both a row and a column matrix. Yes? So this is a name. When I say a row matrix, you remember it's a row. When I say a column matrix, remember what I mean. Okay? Another question, another definition, a zero matrix. First of all, I haven't written the zero matrix because we have how many zero matrices? By the way, what is your impression about a zero matrix? When do you say a matrix is a zero matrix? If you want to define it yourself. Yes? All entries are zero. But now you understand there are how many zero matrices are there? Infinitely many because I, ha I can have different dimensions. These are examples. So this is a 2 by 2 zero matrix. This is a 3 by 1 zero matrix. This is a 1 by 2 zero matrix. This is a 2 by 4 zero matrix. So a zero matrix is a matrix whose entries are all equal to zero. How many of them are there? Infinitely many. So you see these are names. A square matrix, I don't need to explain it to you. What is a square matrix? Equal numbers of... Sorry. Rows and columns, yeah. yes? Yeah. That's a square matrix. And that is also important. A matrix in which the number of rows and columns are equal is called a square matrix. A square matrix has n rows and n columns is called a square matrix of order n. These are the way that I, I, if I, if it's a rectangular matrix, I have to say 2 by 3. But if it is a square matrix, I, do, I can say it's a 2 by 2 matrix, but I can say it's a square matrix of order 2. Then you understand it's a 2 by 2. Which is just names and the way that mathematicians address these things. So these, the following matrices are square matrices. The first one is of order 2, the second one is of order 3, the last one is of order 4. Okay? But one thing that is important, and I probably finish this lesson by this, major and minor diagonals of a square matrix. It's just a terminology, but it's extremely important to know about that. So you see these entries that I have written here, I have, I have highlighted here, it's, we say that they 
form the main diagonal of a square matrix. Okay? So what is the property of the entries on the main diagonal? Can you see that? What is, for example, this is A11. The other one is A22. The other one is A33. So the row index and the column index are equal on all of them. Okay? The other diagonal, which goes from here, A1N, and goes in this direction, that is called the minor diagonal. It doesn't play that much a role in matrix theory. The main diagonal is very important. Is that clear? So that's the definition. And by the way, in, in geometry, when you have a rectangle, you still have diagonals. But the diagonals are not defined for rectangular matrices. So be careful. Yes? When I talk about diagonal of a matrix, automatically I, am ref I, am mean, I mean that that is a square matrix. So be careful. Don't mix up. In, in geometry, rectangles also have diagonals. But in matrix theory, no. Only... Uh, okay, I have also uh, defined these things here. Okay, I will stop here, and then we will continue uh, next time. Okay, I will also upload this PDF file. I have already done that on the Google Classroom for this list. Okay, any questions? Pardon? Yes, you can come here. We can fix. No questions? Thank you. Thank you.